Those early days of touring for me are some of the best memories of my life. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. I want to play something for you. Hearing Never Far by the Album Leaf, the musical moniker of my guest, multi-instrumentalist Jimmy Laval. Jimmy came of age in the arty and subversive San Diego rock scene of the 90s, playing with bands such as Swing Kids, The Locust, and Tristeza. He founded the Album Leaf in 1998, and over the course of six albums and several EPs, he's created a vast sonic universe. Aside from his work with bands, Jimmy is also a film composer. His latest score, Synchronic, premiered earlier this month at Toronto International Film Festival to rave reviews. Jimmy and I met on tour over 20 years ago, and it was great to reconnect with him. I spoke to him in downtown Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Jimmy Laval. It's good to see you, man. I know. It's been forever. I was thinking you're probably one of the few people that's ever been on this show that I've known since I was a teenager. <laughs> How old are you when we met? Like 17. Wow. How old are you now? 39. Wow. Then I was 18. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, we met in 98, I think, on tour. Yeah. And you were playing with Tristessa at the yeah. time. Yeah. You talk to those guys anymore? Not so much. Luis every now and then, which I'm not sure if Luis was on that tour. He was, yeah. He was. Okay, so it was the first go. Does he live in TJ anymore? He lives in Munich. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, met, yeah, I guess a longer, lo- longer winded story, but ultimately um, is in Munich, has a child with a German woman, and is in Munich. He actually sat in on our last show in Munich. Oh, really? Yeah. That Europe. band is still going? No, no, no. He sat in with Albumleaf because he played. He spent some time in Albumleaf too. Oh, like okay, got it. For, he spent like maybe two, three years playing in Albumleaf. Mm-hmm. So he just kind of came in, sat in, played one song, and rocked it, and it was cool. Did you grow up in San Diego? Born and raised. Yeah. What did your parents do? My dad was a mechanic at UPS, first on trucks, then on planes. My mom, I'm not quite sure exactly what all she did, but I do have memories of her being um, a journalist for like a real real estate company, um, magazine, mm-hmm. a member of the City of Commerce of our of our city that I grew up in or our town in San Diego called Lemon Grove that I grew up in. She was a painter. She was an artist. I think she kind of did that in her spare time at that point. She worked at Grossmont College for a little bit, administrative, I think. So it was kind of like, because she was, I have memories of, you know, being at home with her being raised or, you know, and my dad strict, you know, left the house at 7.30 every morning, got home at 6.30 every night, that kind of thing. Like, my entire childhood was worked at, you worked at UPS, for UPS. And, and your mom kind of just hopped around. As, as far as I can remember, I don't have a specific, the only specific memories I have of her jobs are definitely um, journalist, Today's Home, was the magazine, was mm-hmm. what it was called, and um, working at Grossmont College administratively. It's kind of all I can remember, specifically. And what kind of music was on in the house when you were growing up? 70s classic rock. Beatles. Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, 
so that's 60s, not, that's not yeah. 70s classic rock but <laughs> i guess what i'm getting to is it was always beatles simon and garfunkel and then my dad's record collection which was like you know the three dog night and and uh 10 cc and so that's kind of where the 70s classic rock of the memory because i would start to raid his he in in our hallway closet he had his small little record collection and uh I don't remember what age I was. I was maybe like seven, six or seven, I think. And I would go in and like dig into those records and just like look at them because we actually didn't have a record player. So I would just like look at the pictures. And then my brother had a record, got a record player later. Older brother? Older brother. Um, and he was into like Scorpions and Twisted Sister and Cinderella. Do you remember that band, Cinderella? Of course. <laughs> I still love that record, actually. Nobody's Fool, I think is what the record was called. What um, was the hit on it? Nobody's Fool was. And then um, I forget what the like popular song, and I think I'm Shake Me, Shake Me All Night Long. Oh, yeah. Is that Rat or is that or is that uh, Cinderella? I think it's Cinderella because there was also Rat. Um, so that was like my brother's kind of era. Mm-hmm. Hair metal. <laughs> exactly. Would he come And up? it was late 80s yeah so when did you start buying music yourself i want to say fifth sixth grade mm-hmm. i used to buy those like do you remember those cassette tapes singles singles yeah singles wrapped in cardboard yes i would get a lot of those a what lot were of some of the ones that you can remember getting i was in a hip-hop so like dj quick i remember having uh like bell bib devoe and things like of that nature, a tribe called Quest, kind of that era of stuff. I also remember, I think it was my sixth or seventh birthday, and this so I'm just, I'm going back because I didn't buy these myself, but my my dad got me the. Um, do you remember those Beatles Greatest Hints compilations where they would all be looking over the, the like they were inside a stairwell, mm-hmm. and it was like Greatest Hits sixty three to whatever, and then seventy, and they were like red. <clears throat> There's blue a red and, blue, yeah, exactly. yeah. I had a, uh, I got the red one and the blue one. And then I have a strong memory of seventh grade. So this would be 93? 92. 92, okay. No, 91. Okay. Going to get um, Low End Theory came out in 90, it was 91. This is fall of 91. Also, uh, same day as Nevermind. Nevermind, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, going to get those on cassette. Might have even been CD by then. But anyways, I remember skateboarding, skating to the trolley, and riding the trolley out to El Cajon, going to Sam Goody at Parkway Plaza, and getting these things, and con- continuing that kind of trend, like with um, like Gish, Siamese Dream, when it came out. I remember like it. I remember that's like something I was excited for. Like the day it came out, I like went out and got my cassette. And then I have a memory of Faith No More as well. Angel Dust when that record came Mm -hmm. out and that record is actually and Lenny Kravitz Mama said and so those Lenny Kravitz is kind of an odd big deal in my life in in my trajectory in a weird way because I took a trip with my dad I think it was the summer of 8th grade and I had spent time I was in band and orchestra and I was in the drum drum section um but I didn't ever actually play drum set yet. So I was like snare drum, you know, I think. Marimba, I, yeah. Exactly. Actually, when I first started in sixth grade, I was literally, I was on the drum line and I was fourth kick drum, which is one uh-huh. downbeat. <laughs> That's what I started because I was in violin and clarinet um, during that time. But anyways, getting, going on a trip, road trip with my dad in our motor home, sitting in the back, reading the liner notes to Lenny Kravitz, Mama Said, and then seeing that he played everything. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. And I didn't realize like Prince had already done all that stuff. And, right. you know, but I was, and I was aware of Prince and was into Prince and all that stuff, but I just, for some reason, reading the liner notes to Mama Said by Lenny Kravitz and seeing that he played the majority of the instrumentation, I was like, oh, that's cool. And then my other memory of that same trip is um, listening to Angel Dust and air drumming. And I feel like that's how I learned how to play drums was just like spending a summer like air drumming, like getting the getting the mechanics down. I had the single of that song Epic, their yeah. big yeah. smash that was the re- hit. That was a record before, yeah. before Angel Dust. 
<laughs> I played at this weird noise show a couple months ago, and Roddy Bottom was playing on it, and I kind of freaked out, and he was not impressed <laughs> it's like i'm glad you had that experience <laughs> yeah <totally. laughs> i feel like i have friend, well you know uh jp well, i guess it's just jp from that crew and i have that band dead cross Mike right Patton, yes and dave lombardo which is just kind of insanity yeah um, and and i've um i saw them when gabe was singing for exactly. them exactly yeah both of whom have been on this show gabe and dave yeah. uh and hopefully Mike Borden will be on at some point. I've I've been talking to him about coming on, but I haven't been able to make it back up to San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> but that guy's fucking awesome. People don't talk about him enough, but who Mike the drummer from Faith No More. Oh right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know their names. Yeah. Like it was that time. But yeah. he, but you know what? Then after that he went on and played with Ozzy. That guy. I remember his look though. Yeah. His little dreadlocks, yeah. long hair, goatee. Now it's shirtless. It looks even like, cooler because he's yeah. got gray dreadlocks. Nice. He yeah. killed the dreads. That's awesome. Usually I'm not down with like white people dreadlocks, but he, well, he pulled yeah. it off somehow. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I think back then having them, because I had another friend too that like, you know, kind of before you're kind of culturally aware, like that, like you're like, oh, drummer for Faith No More has what? He's a white guy with dreadlocks. Don't really you're in seventh grade or whatever. You don't really put it together. And then now it's a little more. Yeah. It's like, does it count as cultural appropriation? If you are so naive that you don't know that that's what you're doing. I don't know. I mean, that's, I was talking yeah, to this guy, kind of um, the problem. <laughs> well, but I mean, I was talking to, um, Steven McDonald who was mm. on the show last week, the bass player for off and, um, uh, Melvin's and right. Cause uh, Keith Red Morris Cross. is yeah. still rocking. Yeah. Anyway, Steve, well, no, I was talking to him about this. I was talking to him um, because his kid is super into basketball and all of his heroes have cornrows and he wanted to get cornrows. And Stephen was like, sure, get cornrows. So they braided his hair. But then the teacher at their progressive school was like, look, that's cultural appropriation. You can't do that. Right. <laughs> so it's like a weird gray area. It's kind yeah. of like the kid isn't intentionally like stealing somebody's culture. Yeah. He just wants to, it's almost like for him, like wearing his favorite player's jersey or whatever. Exactly. Our, our son, actually, um, had a similar experience where he was at a camp. And at the end of the day, in the PM section of it, where it's just like fun and just they're just doing whatever they want. And um, but he was getting, um, you can do body painting. And he first started with just like snakes and stuff on his arms. And then one day he had a full face painting and he was um spider-man but the new spider-verse version miles black spider-man so his face was black and so we're like whoa like it's black face (laughs) and even though it is spider-man yes and it is that was so it's kind of like huh you know can you is that is that okay and we tried to like make him understand that he wasn't it was a costume and it wasn't you were black spider-man you know the miles that version like you're not you're not dressing up like him you're in a you know just try to kind of like like have the clear distinction that he understood that it was not okay to have blackface and it was you know but it's just trying to make that point clear to him to a six-year-old and i guess it's it's tricky raising right. woke kids these days yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so you're you're in seventh grade. You're playing in band and orchestra. Mm-hmm. You had previously played clarinet and violin, and now you're on percussion. Mm-hmm. When did you start playing drum set? I want to say eighth grade, and I think eighth grade was when I was straight in the drum section because I remember there was other guys that were. I was like, whoa, they're really good, you know the rudiments and all the you know things and stuff like that <clears throat> um i definitely know i knew how to play drums by high school so mm-hmm. somewhere in there and i was also brought over from my middle school to a different school in the district for band specifically beyond uh, so you were line and <clears throat> you were showing an aptitude for it or an interest and you, and they yeah. decided to transfer you 
so that yeah the actual i was actually recruited by the high school to come okay. over and then i joined the snare line i was our freshman with all seniors and the next year i was drum captain and then i quit in 11th grade <laughs> why did you quit the band director changed um i had a really good connection with the first year band director and that whole crew of seniors that i was in with um on the snare line and just everybody and then the next year everything changed i was all of a sudden in charge of all the drummers the whole section you know drum line performances everything there was a new band director and obviously with the band director they were very close knit with all of the captains of the first chairs of each section so i had to deal with her a lot and um i guess we just didn't get get along and it kind of made marching band which was i loved i really loved marching band i really loved drumline performances you know um all of that stuff i love that movie drumline because of that all of those memories you know um being in the outfit and the whole thing and and yeah it just wasn't fun anymore maybe it was like i might have even been like snooty about the music she chose who knows you know like i, I can't really specifically remember but i just wasn't into it anymore and i during ninth grade started to teach myself how to play guitar and so kind of throughout that i kind of started getting into more that was when I was kind of really starting to discover the music that I still, you know, that has shaped who I am and I still appreciate and grew up on. And um, Like what? Eighth grade, I kind of went through, you know, that was when Pearl Jam and, and Nirvana and um, Stone Temple Pilots and... Soundgarden. Soundgarden, especially that's one of my favorite records, Bad Motor Finger. So like, fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> and one of, like, another drummer, Matt Cameron, is just on unbelievable to me and i remember just watching those videos on MTV. he's the best yeah, from that he's, generation he's incredible in and then going to high school and then <laughs> discovering all the like death metal fans in the drum line that like you know all these guys were just super like into sepultura and like deicide and all of those things that were just like whoa okay there's that and then also coincidentally at the same time discovering like ministry and skinny puppy and so just like kind of whoa there's a lot more out there than just like what is kind of being thrown at you and by mtv or like you know popular stuff because we didn't have internet or college radio was kind of not something that i was aware of you know mm -hmm. so it was like radio and your friends whatever your friends were listening to was kind of the discovery and then that ultimately was kind of like this weird era. Like ninth grade was kind of like, okay, I'm kind of into this, I'm kind of that, I like this, I like that, I like, like, you know, also discovering like who I am as a person, wanting to be like these guys on the drum line, but also still wanting to like, you know, be a, be grunge or, you know, just kind of like yeah, identity it's, crisis. It's kind grade. of like, it's something that I talk about on this show a lot it, is that back then music was used as more of a social signifier than it is now. Right. Now everything is available, so mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to um, like make a decision yeah. as to who you are and express it through only one type of music. Right. Yeah. I mean, you didn't back then, but it felt like there was more pressure to do it. And yeah. That's how it but at the same time, I had like friends and bands that were playing shows, and you would go to their show and I was like, "Well, this is so cool! They're playing a show!" Like, "Whoa!" And then you can do then, that. Yeah. yeah. And then I had like started playing in my own bands. I think the following year, my sophomore year, is when I started to actually fall into things and when I started to take note of the local San Diego scene and my local record store, Off the Record, no longer exists. And it might be closed completely, but it's definitely not in its original location. But yeah, becoming a part of that like scene and culture of like, I'm going to go down to the record store. And there's this, you're probably familiar with Hillcrest in San Diego, Fifth Avenue. It was like this whole little stretch of like kind of the, the meeting of all the arts and the musicians and the, you know, the scene and stuff like that all kind of revolved around this record store. And they would have in stores and stuff like that, which I saw like, well, first, my first record, like actual vinyl that I bought was Fugazi in on the Kill Taker. And then that was at Off the Record. I remember like, purchasing this record and then that kind of like then i started to discover indie music so like slant and like june of 44 um and then locally drive like jehu was like a band that just blew my mind and just completely shifted me like entirely in my existence you know it's just like holy shit what this is insane this is the best 
thing I've ever seen and saw them do an in-store at off the record. There's video footage of me of a show in 93, I think it is, or no, 94 or five, <laughs> somewhere in the mid nineties. <laughs> Anyways, pre, I might've just had my driver's license, but bleach blonde hair, front row, just like freaking out, you know? And like, now they're friends of mine, but like back then was just like, oh my gosh. And their peers of artists were like through Mile Pilot, people that were like four years older, four or five years older than me that I super looked up to. And then would go to shows a lot. Gabe Serbian and I were super close friends then and we had bands together and we were trying to be, you know, like Jehu and even even like through Mile Pilot and stuff like that. We had this band, it's called and Gabe, for anybody that doesn't know, is yeah. the drummer from The Locust and a bunch of other bands. And you played in The Locust for a little while. I did. I still have my... Your lip tat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> still have the lip tat for my first tour or my first tour with the locust since the- none of you can see that uh yeah. jimmy has a, a tattoo on the inside of his uh lower lip of the of the locust the locust logo, font logo yeah. and it held yeah. up remarkably well i know i know i got it in the summer of 96 did it hurt it didn't it was my first tattoo so it was kind of um i mean if you ever like just bite your lip yeah it's not like if you bite your bite your arm compared to biting your lip you know it i guess there might be fewer nerve endings yeah. in your lip because it of your lips proximity to your yeah. teeth <laughs> and it was kind of an unfair like introduction to how much a tattoo like what it felt like to get a tattoo because then i got one down my back on my spine and i was just dying and I was like, <laughs> that, that hurt and the rest are i'm you know are, are fine but then you get used to it, but your lip, yeah, it didn't hurt much. And it also took like five minutes, you know, as much as it takes to kind of color in for, you know, and then you just use a serene and, and yeah. So through high school, you are diving deeper into kind of underground music and art. Was that a reflection of who you were personally? Like, were you finding it more difficult to pay attention in school or be like a diligent student or were you able to do both? I did not bad in school, not great in school. I, my, had the mindset of, I think I remember it's so, it's so silly to, to, to think uh, I had school sucks. So do good while you're in it so you can get out of it. Right. (laughs) Something like that. And that was like my high school motto, I think. I think it was mine too. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I couldn't imagine like telling my kids that like, you know what? You know, like it would not be good (laughs) and not what I would want for them in a weird way. Um, What do you want for them? I mean, just to, I mean, actually what I want for them is to just whatever they would like, you know, because we've, you know, I have a son and I have a daughter and I'm really into baseball and I'm really into sports and I'm really into like that whole like thought of like playing catch or, you know, like, or like riding bikes or, or skateboarding or, you know, all of these things. And my son's just not into that. But what he is into is he's insanely creative. His imagination is, is like, I can't even keep up with. He creates nonstop. He's nonstop building. He's nonstop drawing. He's nonstop like just making things and in his head and is just like blows my mind all the time you know totally not interested in i play softball once a week and they came and it was like yeah that was cool (laughs) like would you want to do it no you know just he's incredible like but my daughter's a little bit more i can feel a little more like i mean not sports but just like she's more interested in like riding a bike and scooter and like doing all of the kind of more active things also has a great imagination but leans a little bit more interested in those kinds of things like oh yeah i would want to play softball that would be fun you know stuff like that okay so your motto in high school was school sucks (laughs) so do well enough to get out of it yeah and what did you want to do when you were out of it like what was your mindset at the time um i wanted to be a music teacher i remember specifically wanted to be a music teacher um and even toyed around with like uh, giving my niece lessons and stuff like that. Uh, 
and yeah, I think I wanted it to be, and, and yeah, I wanted to, I mean, for lack of a better word, like be a rock star, you know, play music. What was your, what was your vision of being a rock star? Like, were you thinking you wanted to be like a Fugazi type band? Definitely in that, not like a Cinderella type band. Yeah. Yeah. No, not like that. Or not even like stadium or anything, you know, just like the biggest kind of indie venue in San Diego at that time era was Soma. Um, and I was playing drums for a band called Go 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 Earhart, and um, we opened for Fugazi. And this this is like back in the day where like I was living in um, what is this this house in Golden Hill, which is somewhat notorious, I guess, uh, in in another time period. It's called the Locust House, and I got a phone call, you know, on my rotary phone downstairs, and I picked it up, and I was like, "Is Jimmy there?" Yeah, this is him. Hi, this is Ian McKay, and I was like, "What?" You know, I mean, like, oh, well, hey, you know, and then we're doing a show at Soma. We were interested if Go 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 Earhart could, you know, would you want to open? Um, and I, of course, like, was first, I was kind of a fill in for Go Go Go. Um, I, mean, I was their drummer for a year or so, solid, but definitely was not the main crew. That was Mike and Hash. Um, Hash, who now plays bass for Thievery Corporation. And was kind of like, why is he calling me? Okay. And then, you know, ultimately it's kind of just a funny story to get a telephone call, you know, at, in, on the, on a landline back in 1997, you know, <laughs> Ian still has his landline going. Sure. Man. <laughs> he does. Yeah. When I, when I was over at his house at the discord house recently, there were like four calls to the landline. I'm so he's still I, going strong. I, I, I want one. I kind of want one too. Yeah. I, I actually don't like having a smartphone anymore yeah i would uh, like to be able to like i'm my wife and i talk about it like where we would like to be able to put our phones aside and not feel like you know i mean we could definitely put them aside and and go about your day but like at some point you feel like you have to check it or you have to like or you i'm like, addicted did I, to did it i miss it yeah if i have it on me to it yeah i'm gonna use it it's like cigarettes right. you know but if I can just wean myself off of it again, I yeah. think my life will be better. And I kind of felt like a little bit of comfort knowing like if I had a landline and I wanted to just leave my phone and not think about it, like, you need to get a hold of me, call my landline, you know? And that would make sense. Or like school, for example, like you get worried because you're going to miss something or, you know, I don't know. I actually remember you telling me a story about opening for Fugazi, like yeah. from back 20, 20 years ago or something. Was that the time when Anthony Kiedis was on the side of the stage headbanging? No, Vincent Gallo. Oh, Vincent Gallo. Vincent yeah. Gallo. Okay. Yeah. Might, wait, no. It might have been Anthony Kiedis. Yeah, I yeah. thought you told me that. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And then I, I it was at the Palace in LA because we did three shows with them. Two nights at the Palace, where I think the Palace is no longer. I think it's now that... Avalon, but yeah, in LA, saw Vincent Gallo in the hallway, and back then I didn't, you know, it was like LA was just totally, woo, like glamorous and the whole the whole celebrity thing, and now you live here and you can kind of, oh yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, it's like oh, there's yeah. Sean Penn right. smoking a cigarette downtown, <laughs> yeah. um, which my wife actually waited on Sean Penn and Robin Wright Penn in at a diner in when she lived in New York, and he's chain smoking, mm-hmm. so yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Anthony Kiedis was side stage headbanging, and I saw Vincent Gallo in a, like a stairwell or something like that. Where we're all just kind of mutually hanging around. All the best dudes were there. Yeah, I know, totally. <laughs> so yeah, so that was um, yeah. And then also the one of my the biggest compliments I've ever received was Guy told me my drumming was shit hot. Oh, nice. And I got a broken cymbal from Brendan after that show too. Broken ride cymbal. And that was the first time I saw them in a U-Haul with a dryer in the back. They oh, yes. The dryer in the back of their U-Haul. To dry their sweaty yeah. clothes. While driving around in a, mini, in a minivan. Mm-hmm. 
so economical yeah and efficient <laughs> those guys i still watch fugazi videos i'm pretty sure they get offers to yeah do giant festivals and they're just they don't care. no yeah. yeah some of them want to do it i think <laughs> <laughs> probably you want to put your kids through college in one yeah. fell swoop? <laughs> <laughs> totally. But anyway, you were you we were kind of referencing them as kind of the gold standard. That's yeah. what you were. Them and Unwound though too. Unwound was un- another. Unwound and Fugazi yeah. were what you were aspiring towards. Yeah. Uh, and and then not long after that is when I met you and right. in, in, on one of my first tours with yeah. my math rock band in high school, and that we played was, with you. It was called a Carso. A Carso, right? And we, we played with your old band, Tristeza. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, were Still you... Still pl- repping Milwaukee, too, I see. That's right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and at that time, um, that was kind of your main focus. It was yeah. right before you started Album Leaf. I had released an Album Leaf tape in 98. It was literal bedroom four-track Excuse me, recordings. And it surfaced and it came to be because of being able to play piano obviously and being a guitar player in Tristeza and uh things that I wrote on and Tristeza was a very like arpeggiated melodic style of guitar playing I went no back strumming. To, I, and listened to the yeah. first record um the other day I hadn't heard it in a long time yeah I haven't heard it in it either. holds up yeah oh that's well that's cool good to know <laughs> it brought um, me back yeah that's good to know because uh I, uh, this year is actually the 20th anniversary of the release of Spine and Sensory. And I, two years ago, started the process of trying to, I have my own label, or just a, I can say I have a name of things to release myself under, and I have a distribution deal. So I kind of was like, it'd be really cool to reissue the Tresesa records and do a handful of shows. Um, and, uh, so it would be re-releasing Spine and Sensory. And you're going to play some shows? And play shows, but it's can't seem to get it. Nobody can kind of come together to... Actually, the majority of us are open to it, and then one of them is just kind of holding the same kind of ground. Okay. Um, and trying to basically like, all right, let's do this. Okay. Well, I want to do this. All right. Well, that's all right. You know, just try. I, I would really like to make it happen. I well, think that, it would be really fun. Even if it's 21 years after, who cares? You know, 21 is when you turn, when you can start drinking. Yeah. Then know, the band like, can yeah. get drunk. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but well, yeah, that I was a really that. special time for me too, because it was before I was jaded and everything was <laughs> fun and new. And, and then I everybody that we met on yeah. the road you know, like I, re- I remember that uh, yeah. vividly. I remember yeah. meeting you guys. Um, those days of touring are those early days of touring for me are some of the, my the best memories of my mm-hmm. life and friends that I still have. Obviously, like twenty yeah. years later, twenty five years later, that are just. Do you remember when we were lifelong. on tour and uh, we were playing basketball? And who was it? Stephen broke his arm. Yes, in Utah. And, right. and then you guys went and stayed over at like right. somebody's dad so, was was right. college roommates with John Stockton. Then someone else's dad was friends with Gary Larson of the Far Side. Right. And you guys were staying with all these celebs along the way. That's so <laughs> crazy. And I also, did you play the Denver show with us too? Probably. Steven, that was a rough tour for Steven because he got food poisoning the morning of our Denver show. <laughs> And then we, I think we had to cancel that show or we played it without him. I think we just straight up played it without him and he stayed in, the ho- in a hotel, which was also a luxury back then to have, to have a hotel, a yeah. hotel room, which it was all five of us in one room. But, um, and then, yeah, the following night he broke his arm playing basketball and I think missed that show too, or it was after the show. So he spent the night and basically the emergency room. Right. And then we I don't know, probably took off to, if we're going in that direction, maybe Wyoming or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Who knows where we went, but remember that. But I do sure. remember he did tough it out with the cast for the rest of the shows yeah. that we played with you. Yeah. 
But anyway, I mean, I, I can remember that kind of stuff really vividly because I was so impressionable at the time and it was right. so magical. Yeah. Uh, and far- I had like a huge fondness for Midwest people. Like it was the first, because San Diego scene was very, the hardcore scene that I was involved in, the Swing Kids, the Locust and Guyver One and, and um, that whole era was very like cool. Yeah. Like haircuts, style. White belts, white black belts, pants. Black pants, like all Black these, dyed hair. Yes, yes. Um, Heroin. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, both the band and the drug. Yeah. Um, but, and then, so that was like my introduction into a, a thick music scene. And then I went on tour. And, and it was an influential music scene. It was a very scene. influential music scene. Click Attack Towie, like um, Antioch Arrow, a lot of those bands that were just like mind blowing. Gravity records. Gravity, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the other thing is like band I feel like at that time when I was touring, there were lots of bands that were trying to sound like third wave D C bands, like yeah, Hoover totally. and Fugazi. And then there were a lot of bands that were trying to sound like Antioch Arrow or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Or combining the two. Yeah. But then there was like the Midwest music scene, which is kind of what I was getting at, was like coming out of like such a scene that was so I, I i mean you could say stuck up and just kind of like if you weren't you know like if you weren't part of the crew like you we were cooler you know and like you kind of had this like kind of ego hierarchy to you even tristeza did for a while um and as we like went out into the world um even though i'd already come from like my point <laughs> short story long basically meeting people in the, in the midwest just blew my mind everybody would like wore their heart on their sleeve they were really open they were really nice they were like friendly like we played basement shows and it was just like this community of really warm open loving people that were not afraid of being vulnerable in any kind of way and just were like and it was just like wow this is the greatest thing i've ever been exposed to and i feel like if if i was in san diego for my entire life and never left who knows like how I would be. And that experience also, you know, rolled over into touring the world and, and all of this and meeting all the, you know, types of different people. But like that first introduction to Midwest. So anytime I was going on tour with the Midwest band, I was just like so excited about it. Well, yeah, it's funny. Cause I remember when we met you guys, we were like, these guys seem a little bit too cool for school, but then we were we funny and jokesters fart, and like fart jokes. Yeah. And then it was, there was a lot of ball busting up, in that band, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> which got old. But you know, <laughs> going back to your Lenny Kravitz moment, you know, if there's a through line from that to what you'd started to do as Album Leaf, right? Meaning playing everything yourself. Yeah. Um, what was the impetus to do that? So I think I mean that sparked out of Tristeza. So because songs that I would write for Tristeza that like didn't make it or like didn't you know just didn't make the cut or whatever for whatever reason they just weren't used I would then translate those songs to piano because Tristeza was very melodic arpeggiated playing so it was very easy to kind of translate it to the piano and that's what how Album Leaf was born basically was everything that I wrote that I really liked turned into a album leaf song that wasn't used in Tristeza like storyboard was like a Tristeza song um there was uh two or three songs on my very first record that were Tristeza songs that didn't you know that I just translated to piano and then while playing in Go 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 Earhart we would have practice and all of that band was improv so the way those songs were written were um, Mike, the singer, guitarist, had a eight-track player and would just hit record while we were playing. And then that those jams then turned into songs, and then those songs would be figured out and then, like, you know, made, or he would literally, like, make tape cuts and just, like, turn those songs into... So that's kind of how things were, were created. The point that I'm getting at is that afterwards, he had a Rhodes piano... And that was still the Rhodes piano that I have. Um, that Rhodes piano, and I would kind of tinker on it um, after practices, and he would record me. And then 
oh, cool, let me put drums to it. Oh, cool, let me put bass to it. Oh, cool, let me put these, like he had all these, that was the first time, the first person that I knew that had like vintage synths and stuff like that. And that was kind of like, Go 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 was a really huge influence on my music in many ways. Exposure, like people that I was introduced to. You know, a lot of just like smoking weed (laughs) and like listening to records and having certain things pointed out to me that I never really focused on by Mike and Hash. Those guys were just a couple years older than me. Mike was probably like five or six years older, but his record collection was huge and it was vast and it was, you know, like, and they just had this knowledge of music that like just exposed me to all kinds of things. And I was just like, wow. And then also picking apart and picking apart my kind of like, stuck up ego that I had at the time, you know, of like being, oh, I'm just into hardcore, I'm into like this, or I'm into that, you know, just kind of exposing me and like letting my cool guard down and like realizing that I was just what Where does the cool myself. guard come from? Fear? Yeah, I think so, because it's being a member or a part, not a member, but it sounds like a gang, but being like a part of a scene that just kind of have like a certain amount of standard, I guess. I don't know. We were young. I mean, we were like 17, you know, 18 years old. And I remember being in Swing Kids, Locust, Guyver One, uh, Crimson Curse, like all of those bands. And I was in three of them at once, and I just quit all of it. Had like a falling out with uh, JP back then. And started doing Tristeza and Go 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 and just all these different things. And it was kind of like a like sever of like feeling be a certain way. Even like making album music the entire time that I was like in those bands was writing like really mellow, atmospheric, super like Brian Eno inspired and like stuff like that. So it was kind of like a weird, like I was young, I was a younger part of the older crew, older crew wanted to kind of be in, you know, fit in and, and, figure that out you know so did it also feel empowering to have something that you could do all by yourself definitely yeah i mean it was it was cool to like make something and hear the finished like oh this is this is cool it was so sloppy you know like there was no click tracks or anything like that i would like be tracking drums to a just a Rhodes part that i just like tracked and i would record it like in verse chorus structure like kind of how like i how that movie still kind of operates or how I still kind of write and then just like play along and I can hear like rushes, rush fills like, uh, uh, and like just totally and stuff like that. Um, and it was cool to listen back and be like, wow, I did all that by myself. That's really, that's really fun. You know, did you like having the flexibility of just making a decision and implementing it? I don't have that like clear memory of doing that, but yeah, and I know when you're in like, a band, it's the song that you have to that you write has to make the cut. It has to pass through the creative right. committee. And even on Tristezza Records, I played a lot more than just guitar on those records, and I was looked to a lot to like, what else can we add, or what other kind of thing, you know? Because I had like the with the awesome or the great thing about Tristezza the way that we worked together I think was because I had like training I had done like I knew theory I grew up with lessons I you know um, knew new things and Christopher didn't was just like straight natural player just like picked up a guitar and made put his fingers in places this sounds cool let's put ourselves in alternate tunings this sounds cool he was kind of the creator of all of those things and then I would like make sense of what he was throwing out, you know, that kind of thing. And and then Jimmy Laner was just a drummer that had like the most individual meter that, you know, like a he really could go nice from, feel. Yeah, a really great feel. He could be like 100 BPM to like 120, and you wouldn't really know that that just happened. You know, like click tracks were like really difficult, and and um, but had a really great feel. And we were super influenced by like Tortoise in the whole Chicago scene and stuff like that. But I would basically, while making 
our records, I would go in and like add overdubs. I think on Spine and Sensory, there's a whole, that's like my first official solo recording in a way, because uh, cinematography, the piano version on that record is me and Steven added a uh, keyboard uh, pad, but the rest of it is all me doing like, you know, bells and piano and some guitar, I think. And so that's kind of my first official like solo recording in a way. And then uh, when did Album Leaf become your primary focus? I'd done my first... In 2001 was when Sigaros asked uh, me to open. And so I did that tour. Um, spent the next two years doing kind of both, both things. 99 was my first Album Leaf record. I think it was 2000 or 2001 where both bands signed to Tiger Style. And so I made that my first solo record, uh, or my second solo record on that, One Day I'll Be On Time, and Sigur Rós got that, invited me on tour um, after hearing that record. I did that, came back, and did kind of both bands strong, but more like album is my side thing, and Tristez is my main band. And then in 2003, throughout that time, it kind of started to like, we were figuring out what we like trist as what we wanted to do musically i wanted to get more into like electronics and beats and programming and and um they didn't want to do that it was just like you know direction started to kind of shift we were getting older you know things like that and uh then in 2003 cigarettes asked me on tour again um this time europe and the states um so i went and did that and I think after that is when I kind of was like, I think I'm just going to focus on Album Leaf. And, you know, things started to feel better um, with Album Leaf. I was kind of gaining the same like, popularity or exposure, um, drawing the same crowds, and just kind of, it was just kind of like started to even out. And I just felt like, so yeah, I just made the choice and left. And we played what I thought was Tristez's last show because we announced it as Tristez's last show. Um, but yeah, I mean, so during that time, I think it was 2003, 2000, yeah, it was 2003, I decided to focus on Album Leaf completely. And then I went to Iceland in the summer of, or the fall of 2003 to start making In a Safe Place. With the Sigur Rós guys? Yeah, at their studios, or at their studio. <clears throat> and um, spent the year or spent the first like kind of four months of that year going back and forth, um, making that record and then signing to Sub Pop within that time period. And how did this all lead to scoring? I mean, it's all tied together actually to that record as well, in a way, because... Were you getting lots of syncs for that record? So that record, the entire record was synced and used on the OC. the OC I also which feel was like big at the time was big at the time and was also big for indie music. Um, it kind of I feel like changed the 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 landscape of indie artists. I mean, I feel like they are responsible for Modest Mouse and Death Cab for Cutie being as big as they are still. Um, I feel like it all kind of started. I mean, hard work from those bands, obviously, and they were doing you know they were doing good. But like by the time that those placements and I mean, I think there was like death cab posters inside somebody's somebody's room, bedroom yeah. and like stuff like that. Um, Modest Mouse played at the whatever the I think death cab played on the show too. Anyway, um, so I had a lot that my whole record that whole record was synced except for Over the Pond was synced on um, on that show, and I also got a placement on the comp. Um, one of the songs was on a placed on an OC comp. And that kind of started my, I had like some sync placements in like MTV, Real World and Road Rules and all of those like things where they'd pay you a dollar, <laughs> um, which still I can't believe that people got away with. Like the, the sync fee was a dollar, but you got the back end right. and, that, and that added up. Um, and there was a time period where I like, I got my BMI check and I was just like, whoa this is real money. This is like the most money I've ever seen. You know, this is, this is crazy and feeling very good and accomplished enough. And like, you know, slowly building up to feeling like I could not work a day job and the kind of like spend more time touring, have this like supplemented income from 
syncs and publishing and it started to work. What was your day job up until then? I had so many jobs. <laughs> I was I did sound at the Casbah. I was a sound guy for a long time. I ran a delivery service. Um, a like a I guess a, a precursor to what Postmates is. Um, that whole world. Um, it was a yeah. You would call in your order and look at the website and stuff like that. And then I would dispatch to drivers. And I was first a driver for one of those services. Um, and then I got moved into the office and I was man- managing it. Um, I was also a busboy and barista at a restaurant. Um, I did all of these three things at once. Um, I made health food bars for a Hare Krishna company. All kinds of random things. But yeah, I made a conscious, like kind of like scared choice. Um, I was also living in a like a studio apartment with... Uh, Zach from Pinback and uh, Toby from Blackheart. Wait, three people were sharing a studio? It was um, this kind of like communal. Um, Zach's dad is an architect and build these, built these houses. Um, they're called the Go, Go Homes. And uh, Rafter Roberts, that's where I met them. We had like mastered my record in there. And so there was these kind of communal living spaces where you had like these studios and you would like share a kitchen. Sometimes you'd share a bathroom, but they were all very private. So like, it was almost like you were like in a four bedroom apartment, but everybody had their own entrances. So it was all like very secluded and private. And so there was a new building that I got into the same situation with, um, Zach and his girlfriend or now wife, um, basically had their own place completely and then toby and i shared a upstairs downstairs with a kitchen and so it's like a small studio but somewhere in that time i then moved into my own two-bedroom apartment kind of like started to make a steady income and was getting success with sync and then fast forward to basically 2009 um this film called tori's distraction i was playing a show in albuquerque the bass player his name's matt um his old friend was making this documentary. She passed a DVD through him to me because she was using a lot of my music and wanted an okay. And uh, I offered to score that as opposed to using the music. So that was kind of my first, you know, parlay into scoring. And that's when it kind of started. And I didn't really put the two together. Like, I, I've, I'm already making music that sounds like score. Yeah. And I could be doing it. So that was kind of the first time that I kind of put it together, I guess. What is your mindset when scoring versus writing your own music? Like, do you prefer one or the other? Coming from coming from a background of just feeling like I've always just made music, I kind of have that same approach where I'm just making music. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just like shaping a a scene you know like musically like getting inspired by what's on screen and and what's happening or and then trying to convey that in a in in music so i'm still like and that inspiration still rings true just with album leaf stuff or my own music um just by being inspired by something so i kind of feel like i enjoy scoring more because i it's constant creation, so you're constantly writing. You're like always writing new music, really. If you look, if you look at it that way, you're always writing something, and you're always forced to kind of like 
create something. Whereas, like, it seems like with album leaf and making an album leaf record, I tend to hold myself to like my catalog or like the trajectory of albums. Like, oh, I did this, this, this. I feel like I've gotten like progressed into this thing. And so, what's the next thing going to be? And I feel like I put a lot of pressure on myself to create something that is worthy of an album leaf record. Like I've sometimes said that, like, oh, I don't think that song makes a cut or something. You know, it's like you just hold it a little more true. And I think with scoring, the pressure is off. Um, yeah, it's a, a diff- different, different kind of, way. It's a different yeah. kind of vulnerability. Right. When you're scoring, you're vulnerable in the sense that someone else is the arbiter of whether or not what you do works. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, that's freeing because you're not necessarily having to expose like your soul in order yeah. to make it work. <laughs> but when you're making your own music, then you're the one, the, the buck stops with you. Yeah. But the statement has to be authentically something that you're feeling and, and that's scary yeah. in a different way right? and hard in a different way. Yeah. But what I like about scoring, like you said, is the deadline. Like yeah, there's, there's a, a deadline. There's an external clock ticking. And for me, it allows me to get out of my own way. Right. Um, because I don't have time to think too much. I just yeah. have to get it done. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, Oh, look what I did. Right. Totally. <laughs> you know, totally. So what is your balance? Like, Right now, you have two kids. You're married. Mm-hmm. What does a day look like for you? Waking up around, I don't know, we get up around 7, sometimes a little bit later. Our kids actually sleep, so we have to wake them up every morning. <laughs> um, but, yeah, getting them to school right now we're in summer, so it's getting them to camps. Um, around, like, you know, leaving the house around 8.30-ish. Then I get back, and I'm in my studio. I I feel like I'm more work oriented and focused and scheduled now and it's more um, because you have kids yeah it's um yeah like you're i just feel like i'm uh i don't know why the word is escaping me um more productive now um in that scenario because there's a time period it's almost like your own deadline again you know i'm drop them off come home, work, and then pick them up or relieve the babysitter at a certain time. Um, normally my days end over by five, six. So I'm in there from nine, 10 to five or six. And it's healthy. It's healthy. It's Monday through Friday. Um, weekends I don't work. And that's basically... When did you decide that? It kind of... It, everything happened post kids, you know, mm-hmm. this schedule too. Cause before I used to, like, I would sleep until 12, two in the afternoon. Um, and, then but work I would all also, night. and I would work all night. I would go into my studio at like 8 PM and be done at like any time between four and 6 AM and then sleep. And then if I woke up at 10, I was like, Oh my God, I woke up early today. You know, it's like, <laughs> was it a natural adjustment when you had the kids? Like, no. did it feel like your body clock just knew what to do? Not at all. <laughs> um, I was immediately kind of forced into a new schedule, obviously, of like of sleep. Yeah. Um, but also just, you know, pregnancy and those times and those nine months are also kind of training. So you have that time to kind of adjust. Um, maybe to, like to what it's going to be, you know, like... Um, Obviously, you're not going out as much anymore. So I don't know. Just like or you are, but I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out how to explain it right. But like, it's a kind of a good setup, setup, you know, for like the the the, the main event. But even though the main event has nothing, you're just whoa. You like, it's a complete life change. Um, and you can read, you can do this, you can do, you can, you know, be mind, like ready in your head and okay, it's going to be like this. And no, it's, it's just, it's all, you know, very personal and it's all very just dictated by whatever personality the baby has and however your dynamic is and all of those things. Um, so 
I'm not sure what my work hours were during pregnancy. Um, I feel like I, I think I had like a, a thought of like, oh, I could be up all night with the baby if I need to, because that's my normal work hours. And then, yeah, I don't know, you know, like I think I had maybe even said that and, and that was silly too, to, to even think. Um, because obviously, yeah. And then there's a time where you, you have to be a kind of a normal daytime person uh, again, or, or you have to start to adjust to that. And I remember for a year, a solid year or so, and I've actually spoken to a lot of, a handful of other musicians that have had kids that are like, it was so hard to f- figure out how to get back into a work schedule and how to get back into a routine or to establish a routine. Um, Cause that's what essentially you have to do is just establish a routine. It's not, you know, I couldn't be like sitting at the table and I come up with some idea and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to hang on. <clears throat> let me go figure this out for a couple hours. You know, like I used to be able to, or I used to think I, you know, um, it's definitely not like that anymore. So it took a long time to, to learn to be creative in a allotted amount of time, you know, like you had to be in the studio working. This is your time of creativity, create, because it's not, you know, it's, and that took a long adjustment, you know, besides adjusting to being a parent, being a partner, being a, you know, all well, of those things. The other thing is making sure that you're putting up boundaries as far as people that you're working with, you know, and, right. and their, their claim to your time. Yes. Uh, Having hard outs. Yeah. <laughs> hard outs are, are a, definitely a, a thing <laughs> nowadays. What do you want to do that you haven't done yet? Oh, man. Um, there's a couple things that come to mind. I guess scoring outside of my box, meaning like actually writing a piece for an ensemble that's created, you know, working with an orchestrator, having all of those things done. I feel like I, the scores that, the films that I've done that music has not been needed, you know. That kind of score has not been been the been the kind of score. I think that would be something that would be fun to do. Um, but I still have a love of making records and creating songs. So I don't really know the. lifespan of album leaf anymore i know that i have less and less interest in touring and i have less and less interest in playing shows uh, i mean in, in touring i have tons of interest in playing shows i'm trying to figure out that balance of how can i make that formula work of me not wanting to be after touring for over 20 years like and just having a different outlook and different personal life um VR, man. Yeah, totally. I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, I'm not sure about what the future holds for Album Leaf um, as a project, as a band name, as a, you know, as a, as a what it is. But I do want to make records. And so I think producing and making records with other artists and finding, you know, I still feel like there's, almost more collaboration in record making these days than there has been, um, at least in the indie level, I guess, or maybe it's just more exposure because obviously, you know, you go back to go back to the Brill building. uh, Yeah, exactly. There was a lot of collaboration, right? It was, you know, there's 25 songwriters on one song or something like that. Um, that's an exaggeration, but you know, but yeah, working with somebody, making a record for them, giving them a finished product, being proud of it, not having to tour it or be, you know, a part of it that way but i enjoy making music i enjoy collaborating i enjoy um performing so if you could produce anybody who would oh, it be man. i i think in 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 my mind it would be someone that is is, is i don't know say starting out or 
helping somebody come helping into their somebody own. come into their yeah. own and like creating a record and kind of like you know helping them find a a vision or something like that or cr- helping them create what they're looking to do but also being able to lay my flavor you know having people come to me for what I do naturally mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um is something I would love, but I would also love those people to be able to like also challenge what my natural instincts are. I mean, it seems like that's what you're looking for on the scoring front too, is that you have a certain sensibility and for better or worse, that's led people to you who want something that you've already done. So what you want is to kind of maintain some sort of aesthetic through line, but expand. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I've had a lot of work actually in the last year and it's all come to me via what I've done. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. You know, that's kind of like, this is great. Like they're, and it's based on scores, not um, really not album releases. It's based on scores that I've done um, or, you know, films. So that's nice for me because that's, I also did another film this year that was way out of my comfort zone and it was fun. Um, but it was, it was tough, you know, trying to find what's that film called. It's called the fuck it list. <laughs> <laughs> is it out? Um, it is, I'm not sure what's going on with it. It's, um, it's in the, like, I don't know. It's in the like paramount universal sell to Netflix. What are we doing? I'm trying to get, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of like some weird, um, thing that I just, it's got no deadline. Okay. So that's kind of a, I'm done with it. You know, the score is done, but there's... Well, I was like just asking because I, yeah. I didn't know if I could say it's on Netflix or it's... Uh, right, no. Um, it's on IMDb, so if you want to like, keep tabs <laughs> on it, follow it there, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have no idea what's, what's to come of it. But it, like, I ended up like doing something that was totally out of my comfort zone, totally different, but not in the world of Soundalike. You know, mm-hmm. Soundalike is something that I did like kind of early on where like... It's kind of fun when you're starting out because then exactly. it allows you to explore recording techniques right. and things like that but and push you as like oh yeah. what am i able to do yeah okay i'm able to do this but when it comes down to it and creating something that's true to you is true to you not mm-hmm. you know even the direct film directors that i've worked with i'm on their currently on their third film our third film together their fourth they have reminded me every time and i've totally not even aware that like whatever their temp was i've com- i've strayed so far from and I've done my own thing collaborating with you know with their guidance as well but just like the temp was just what was the temp you know you've strayed you i don't remember you, it's almost like i don't pay attention to it even though i do but it's like i don't know i feel like that's kind of a good thing too well jimmy my old friend from over 20 <laughs> years ago it's great to see you again and it's great to see that you're doing so well yeah. thanks for being on the show yeah man thanks for having me Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs>